everyone. I'm going to start two minutes early because then I get two minutes extra to, to talk to you. So, um, firstly, morning. Um, also, thank you to the organisers of, of DBAS Dev Day for accepting this, this talk. Um, just to put it out there up front, this is a very beginner centric um, session. But really, what we want to start to really touch on is well, what are the options? We have an overwhelming amount of options when it comes to running cloud native databases, um, which is a good thing, freedom of choice and all of that good stuff, but it's also an overwhelming freedom of choice as well. Um, so what we want to do here is talk about some of the, the good, the bad and the unknowns about how that journey has gone to get to where we are today in regards to what options we have. So first of all, I'm Michael Cade. I work for a company called Veeam Software. We focus on protecting workloads. I actually focus on custom by Veeam. You'll see us on the show floor. And really the, the key area there is protecting Kubernetes um, state for workloads, databases, data services within your Kubernetes cluster, but also external to your Kubernetes cluster. So I'm not going to talk too much about backup because I don't want to send you all to sleep, but I just want to have that in the back of, back of your minds is that wherever we put data, regardless of where, whether it's in Kubernetes, virtual machines, cloud-based PaaS, we've got to consider that there is a, a requirement to protect that workload regardless of where it is, whether that's you in the room have to do that and have that responsibility, or whether that is uh, over the fence to some operations and, and infrastructure people. So just a bit about me, I'm from an infrastructure and operations background, very much started in the storage and virtualization space, and then two or three years ago, I got uh, parachuted into uh, the cast and buy Veeam acquisition that Veeam made to basically go and make noise, go and do sessions around backup, and. Um, it was very much learning on the job about what, what is cloud native, what is Kubernetes, what is state for workloads. And uh, when I first came in, it was when around the CSI was becoming the de, fa the de facto way of being able to present storage to your, to your Kubernetes cluster. So I've seen quite a bit and spoken quite a bit about that journey. Uh, noticeably from, from my like, community, community is massively important to me. Um, as a technologist within the company, I created a project called 90 Days of DevOps. And obviously, it's a bit broader than cloud native or, or CNCF. But really, what that was is to put structure and to put a little bit of guidance around those people just having to learn and understand a little bit more about, about this. So that's a GitHub repo. If you search for 90 Days of DevOps, you'll definitely find it. It started out as a, a load of blog posts a load, um, that I did on GitHub, and it's made it to around 24, 25,000 stars. A great resource, apparently, so I'm told. And we're, it's continued over the last couple of years. You can pretty much find me on any of the, the social medias, whether it be Michael Cade or Michael Cade one um, If there's any questions afterwards, I'm also in the Slack channel. Um, so if you wanted to ask any, any questions afterwards, then we can get into, into it there. So in terms of the three things that I kind of want to cover throughout the rest of the, the, the 20 minutes that I've got, because of the two minutes extra that I just stole to introduce myself, um, why run databases in cloud native? And that, that's going to go into a little bit of the misconceptions that we have as well around, around running databases in, in, in and around Kubernetes. Um, actually, what options do we have when it comes to running databases on Kubernetes? And then how? How are we going to run those, those databases? Now, I don't have long enough to go through the history of databases and how we got here, um, but I will say that, that Matty and, and Kat did a great session at a user group earlier on this year. Um, Matty from Avon, Kat from Dell EMC, they talk about the history of the database, well worth a, a, a little a, a search on that and having a, having a look at, at that. They'd also had a few drinks, so it's quite entertaining to watch. Um, but they're going to talk about how we got here more than, more than I can in, in 20 minutes. But hopefully, as I'm surrounded by people that came to a database-focused event, you probably know roughly how we got here. OK, so what is a cloud-native database? So a cloud-native database is a database that is designed to take full advantage of cloud technology and distributed systems. OK, great. That's a great um, example of what, or a definition of what, what we're looking at here. I also would say, so this is just that small subset of, of uh, 
the CNCF landscape and the databases that we have or the data services that we have in that top left hand corner and we have quite a lot uh, and that's accelerating at a, a large rate of knots in, in regards to all of the different logos, all of the different types of databases, be it NoSQL, SQL, but equal, equally the vector databases that I know there's a session on later as well to, that I want to hear more about as well. But all, with that all in mind, there's still this misconception around Kubernetes is not ready for stateful applications, not ready for data services. I would argue that everyone's sitting in this room and there's another room over there with data on Kubernetes and it'll be as, just as packed as this one is. I would say that misconception has been well and truly um, snubbed right now. But the initial focus absolutely was on that, that stateless application. But and the, the, the key area was when, they, when, they, when we separated the, the, the storage requirements, so when an enterprise storage system had to wait for the Kubernetes code release to happen, that was slowing things down and we weren't getting to where we needed to be as fast as we wanted to be. Now that we have CSI, the container storage interface, it enables us to run those databases, those data services alongside or inside of our, our Kubernetes cluster. So we have first class storage support, um, and we have lots of different storage vendors that are able to, out of band, create capabilities within, their, within your Kubernetes cluster. So if we want to dive down in a little bit, what's different between a traditional database, so a database that we may be running a virtual machine or on a physical server, to what a cloud native database actually looks like is, is around, so a traditional, you know, we, they kind of fix things around scalability and security and accessibility. I should put asterisks around some of these as well. But from a cloud native point of view, we want, we're, we're considering around the design phase of that. What does that look like in terms of being able to leverage those cloud um, features that we have, whether it be in the public cloud or, or based on Kubernetes or any cloud native system? It should be able to run from a, a container standpoint. Cloud ready versus cloud native. So just because a database can run in the cloud doesn't make it cloud native. A virtual machine running in an EC2 instance isn't cloud native. It doesn't scale um, the, way it, the way it should. It should have the services, software, and the APIs that enable us to enhance that, that elasticity of that database being able to scale up, scale down, and deliver that as a service, even though we might not be offering that as a, as a service provider. We might be just needing that for our, our application and be around Kubernetes as a, as a de facto way of being able to orchestrate um, our, our, uh, our, con our cloud native databases. So benefits of those cloud native databases, you've got advanced scalability, so we can scale up, scale down as, as fast as we want. I'll try and show you some of that in, in regards to a demo shortly as well. We've got the elasticity of that, where we, where, how and when we, when we run that and when we scale that. The resiliency of that, having multiple copies of that running available to us across multiple geos, multiple regions. Automation, a lot of that needs to be automated in terms of when do I need that to be scaled up and scaled down according to load or to requirements. The accessibility, again, goes back to that ge geography, region type, type demand. The cost of that, and I'm going to get into that a little bit because that, that should have an asterisk on, again, around depends. Um, and then the management of those cloud native databases because what this trend is doing is allowing us not to just have one large database server and we're just going to throw everything into it like I think we did traditionally is now we can choose the right database for the right job. So whether that is a NoSQL or a, or a, a MySQL for one job, a MongoDB for another, et cetera, et cetera. We can choose the right job and that, the concept of um, micro database services kind of becomes a, a reality with, with cloud native. So where do we see cloud native databases? It's not just running a stateful set within Kubernetes. We see um, running outside of, of the, the Kubernetes cluster. So think about PaaS-based services such as MongoDB Atlas or uh, Amazon RDS to name a, name a couple. The application is still within the Kubernetes cluster, but it might be hooked into that PaaS-based service. But that PaaS-based service and notice how I'm not saying that this is a virtual machine sat in EC2 or an, in a virtual machine, but this, this gives us the ability to scale accordingly what that needs to look like, but our application 
has that access into that, into that data service. We might also be running a dedicated infrastructure Kubernetes cluster where we run all of our storage for and exposing that out to maybe another cluster or to another service that leverages that. Um, a lot of enterprise storage actually have gone down this route as well to be able to define what their storage offering looks like. And then running stateful workloads within the cluster right next to your application that requires the latency, the, the control as well. Because I'm going to go through some of these areas because not, not all, uh, it's not one size fits all. It's, there's going to be some, um, some good, bads, and unknowns um, to, to why. So here, I, I just wanted to kind of touch on what's the ease of use but versus the cost. So if we think about a virtual machine, traditionally virtual machine or physical, you could kind of have there in the middle. You've already made that, or your company has already made that, potentially made that investment, especially VMs on, on premises or physical. You've already got that server. It's quite a, a, a task to be able to then look to migrate or relocate that or, or at least um, repurpose that into containerization or, or cloud native, um, yeah, into a cloud native format. So sometimes that, that middle ground is, is the, the easy button, right? We stay there. And that's kind of what we're seeing in the industry is that it's much harder to move petabytes of data than it is to, to do the front end first and containerize that. But then we've got three different other options. We've got PaaS, which could ultimately be a much higher ease of use because we take away a lot of the control, a lot of the, the tweaking of, of, uh, of what that needs to look like. But then also, it's going to cost you a lot more money. So you pay for the, the advantage of not having to look after the, the underpinning operating system or the, the hardware even underneath that. You're paying someone else to look after that. But then you've got stable sets, so much lower cost, but it's kind of middle of the road from a, from a manageability point of view. And then over to the, the right, again, ease of use, but again, cost, because you've hopefully already invested in your cloud native infrastructure, whether that be Kubernetes, you've then got your operators. So hopefully that, that makes sense as to where that is. But, and it starts to dive into a little bit more of the, OK, so I've got all of these choices, this overwhelming amount of choices as to where I run my database. But OK, which one should I choose? And I think it comes down to, depends on you and your team. If you want more control of your database, then you're probably not going to go into the PaaS. If you need more control and, and performance, you're probably going to go down to this, this bottom right-hand corner in the future. But it might be that you're stuck because the business won't allow you to move out of that VM model that you maybe once had. OK, so stable sets um, came around. So a stable set is the way in which we can provide um, a way in which the Kubernetes controller to define what our application and data looks like. So a stable set versus deployment, again, in a, in a longer Longer, if I had longer time, we could go through what is a stateful set and what is a, a, a deployment. But de a stateful set is going to define what um, or how, how, a, how your, your pods are, are rolled out and then ultimately the rollout um, strategy for that. When you run a stateful set, you're going to have whatever that pod name is, hyphen zero, one, two, three. Whereas in a deployment, it's going to be some spurious UUID. And actually, if you, if you start scaling up, scaling down a deployment, it's going to, it doesn't, there's no order. When it comes to a stateful set, we're going to go three, two, one, zero, and we're going to go zero, one, two, three in terms of rolling out. In terms of good, um, it gives that ordered deployment that I kind of mentioned, that unique identifier to that. Um, uh, from a bad point of view, though, if you're just managing a stateful set through a YAML, file for multiple, multiple databases. I remember I said, now I've got the choice. I've got an overwhelming choice, but a freedom of choice of being able to choose all of these different databases for different tasks. And I've got a different stateful set for each. Now I've got to manage all of the YAML for that. That's, that, that seems like an overwhelming headache as well. So complex configuration, um, scaling limitations on that as well. But it gives you and the rolling updates. Um, as well as the unknown. How, what does the performance look like? I don't know what your cluster looks like. So there's generally not going to be any speeds and feeds because a Kubernetes cluster can be the smallest of performance to the, to the most money that anyone can spend and give you all the resources you need. There's no 
There's no linear, lineage to, to that. Now, this is where I would go in and, and normally do a, a quick demo on what a staple set is, the benefits of that, and then be able to do that. What I'll do is I'm recording a session. I'll record a longer version of this and put it onto, onto YouTube or somewhere, and I'll share that in the, in the Slack channel. But really, looking at how do we deploy Postgres as a staple set within our Kubernetes cluster. And the one thing I kind of missed out here, and I'm conscious of time, is, is also around Helm. Helm gives us maybe a little bit of a gap in between deploying a staple set and having to manage all of my YAML manifests to being able to deploy using a Helm. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes and be able to deploy my application that way, whether it be Postgres or MySQL. And then we get to operators, and operators kind of take away some of those, those burdens that we that we maybe have from a, just a, a, a vanilla staple set in that it gives us automated operations. It means that we could use, uh, for example, the cloud native Postgres operator allows me to go and deploy what I want, a desired state for whatever that Postgres implementation needs to be. It allows me to leverage custom resources. It extends Kubernetes to be able to leverage that, um, which also allows me to then look at the scalability of that and the self-healing around that. So, taking away some of those pain points that we have in just staple sets. Now, operators generally will be using staple sets as well, but you've got a higher, a higher level overview of that, a, a, a controller, if you will, that is going to be looking at that staple set or looking at the whole deployment and making sure that, that things are the desired state. The reconciliation route loop is going to make sure that things are how they should be. Bad um, around complexity and resource intensive, yeah, because you're running something that's looking at something and, and it's going to be giving you that, but ho hopefully that's worth the squeeze around that. Um, security implications around custom code, again, I would go into more detail around that. Um, and the unknown is the operator, operator ecosystem. Granted, it's thriving at the moment. There's lots out there. If you go and look at the operator hub, we've got lots and lots but there obviously could be a lot more. There's a lot more data services that are available. The one that I mentioned, Cloud Native Postgres, um, is, is a, a, a popular option, as is Crunchy Data, which is also a Postgres operator. And again, this is where I'd go in and just show you what, what that would look like in terms of that, that deployment and what, it, what, it, um, what that desired state loop actually looks like. OK. so. What is that operator doing? It's looking at this reconciliation loop. So it's basically, we're defining what our database service needs to look like via underpinning YAML again. But it's going to be constantly checking to see whether that desired state has been achieved. So if you want three pods in your um, Postgres deployment, then it's going to constantly go through, observe, and adjust what that needs to look like. Um, again, that's going to allow us to update that. There's a lot more. You could do a whole session on the reconciliation loop um, and some of that, the continuous control. It's going to be synchronizing the, the state between the three or, or however many pods or um, nodes that you have within your cluster uh, and all of that, that good stuff. So then that brings us on to the, the third and final option around external PaaS. So PaaS the overhe overhead, overhead, overheard, overhead. Um, again, this brings us the ease of use, but the cost is going to be up there, which is fine. As long as we're aware of that, that unknown, then that's what we can take to our business and we can say, look, I'm not a DBA. I don't want to be um, in charge of making sure and tweaking configurations. I want to make sure that it's a managed service. Let's push that off to someone who knows what they're doing, and we're just going to consume the database as a service within one of the public cloud hyperscalers or, or one of the many um, options that we have out there. Now, that obviously from a bad point of view, if you're a DBA and you're looking at and you want or need to be able to tweak those, those, uh, those uh, constructs, then you've got limited control when it comes into PaaS, but also that cost. But the unknown is, is where is my data? And that, again, might fall to some of you in the room, but equally, that data sovereignty, where is my data? How, how do I know it's following regulation? It gets a little bit more reaction over in Europe, um, in the EU, because of GDPR. But it's a thing to consider, and it, it's, a, it's applicable to, to the US and holding any, any data for EU residents as well. Um, 
The unknown as well is around performance, although I would say that, especially in the hyperscalers, that performance, they'll, they'll give you as much performance as you need, but you're just going to have to pay for it, um, is kind of the, the, the take there. And I've listed some of the um, options that we have, have available. And again, this is where I would go to show you what that looks like from a Kubernetes cluster point of view, where my, maybe my front end, my application runs and connects into my AWS RDS or MongoDB and gives us the ability to, to leverage that data service outside of my cluster, but within the confines of, of the Kubernetes um, cluster using config maps and, and secrets. Okay, four minutes left. I'm glad I did take that extra two minutes. So conclusions, micro databases are here. I think that's why we're all in this room listening to what, what the latest is around Kubernetes and data um, or databases and, and cloud native. Um, one thing I will highlight, and this is the, the boring backup admin guy coming up on stage first up in the morning to say that it doesn't matter which one of those three you consider, you still need to look at protecting that, whether that's your responsibility or whether that's the business. We still need to protect that. Just because high availability is not a backup, we can still replicate bad changes. I'm sure many of us have, have made a, 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 the, wrong, the wrong move or the wrong change within our, within our um, databases. So we still need that backup. But we also might need to still consider things like disaster recovery as well. Um, I think what this, this is exciting because it allows us to choose the right database for the job. I remember years gone by when I was a sysadmin and we, would, we spent a lot of money on a certain, a certain database type, but we'd have to, we basically had to engineer everything into that, that database type. So everything into, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna just say or, Oracle. We had to use that Oracle license like it was going out of fashion. So we had to push every single database into that because we wanted to get our, our spend from that. Now, from a cloud native point of view, I don't, I don't have that constraint anymore. I can use the right tool for the right job. And it's exciting to see some changes around databases in the, in the ecosystem, particularly around things like SurrealDB and what they're doing around being able to bring in. It's no longer just a NoSQL versus SQL. They've got a bit of everything all under one, all under one hood. This is where I would ultimately go and then show a demo around, or how do we, how do we protect those, those data services? And again, any of those three, I've got an option, option to be able to protect. We also, um, this week, and I don't know if the PR has actually gone out yet, but we, we donated a, a way in which we can protect those data services to the CNCF. It's a project called Canister. Um, and Canister gives us the ability to protect those data services through a, an application framework or a blueprint framework where you basically define what you want to do and how you want to protect it. So hopefully you'll see a little bit more about that, whether it be in the news or across the show floor. But this is really, and canister.io is the address to, to find out more. It's quite a, a mature product, project that we've been working on for a number of years. But our focus here is, is to really raise awareness of data protection, data management, resiliency within that, that data service. And just to finish up, some additional resources and much smarter people than me. You've got um, a session by Karen Jex from Crunchy Data. She actually talks about the Postgres uh, operator that they've created over there and actually walks through in a less than an hour session, well worth a watch. Um, another guy, and he's here this week as well, so if you get a chance to bump into this guy, he's kind of changed his tune, I think. I, I think I can say that, I'm a, I'm a friend of his. Is Victor Farset, um, and he, um, he's very much talking that same game around that you've got this overwhelming amount of choice, just choose the right one. You're not going to be able to, or it's likely, and Kelsey Hightower says something similar, it's, it's, it's likely that you're not going to be able to build your own RDS that scales the same as RDS. So take that into consideration as well. But that's another benefit of cloud native databases in that Maybe on day one, we do build our own, our own operator, or at least leverage an operator that gives us that, that ability. Then later on, we can always migrate that into, quite easily into, into a cloud-based um, service. The other um, podcast type session is Cloud Native Weekly, well worth a watch. They've been talking about um, the state of the database for 
or at least stateful workloads over the last couple of weeks. So with that, nine seconds left, so I've got us back on, on time. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, so if there's any questions.